Unfortunately, I'm the one who discovered it. I'm the one who said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've never seen this from this in 20 out years. And I've got four of them. What's it called? Did you see it? I don't know. I don't know. So I asked the lab, I said, if we yeah. ever go through this in the whole time, then you should get some more. Yeah. Yeah. We got you a back second one, like a third one, and these people are most sinus Those are people that are just refractory sinus patients, and they got treated endoscopically. Because I wanted to get this here. We saw the ENT. The unfortunate thing is that we have a nurse of course, a infection control nurse. She's the one who sort of did a half-assed study in the MRI. I carried it around for a while. We were in a they don't have the patients that exposed, but yeah. they were exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Now that just really yeah. torqued me. I said, so you never learned it. Now yeah. we know we have a You never know where it came from. Yeah. What? And they, they never yeah. learned it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Until after the fact, it was all over. Yeah. See, my nurse is a supervisor. I have heard way more than I want to know about. Never. She's back to Vienna. So more oh, yeah. 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 Sort of a bit of a And like, she always had one or two that came to one or two. Yeah. 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 They only choose to shop. We did, but not there. Yeah, the third one, they said this is probably the identity. Oh, I know. So, yeah. Nobody was really sick. Now, there's all these people who keep calling in, you know. I, I saw them 10 years ago. I don't want to step in that now. I'm sure I guess. So they just don't put themselves up. Announcements. I'll just remind you that for those going to the meeting, there are dinners um, Sunday and Monday. So if you haven't RSVP'd and you want to attend those, go ahead. We'll send out the announcements again. I don't know if the rest of you got this, uh, a national meeting from the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Anybody uh, interested, I've got a copy of it um, for those uh, national meeting in Baltimore. Troy Torgerson is one of the people on the schedule. Um, David's uh, got a pretty impressive presentation from looking through his handout today. Um, for those on the outside who don't know him, David Hagen is one of our first year fellows. Uh, he's from Israel. I asked him to give the entire talk in Yiddish today. <laughs> the role of IgG4 and allergy immunotherapy, and other diseases. It may actually make more sense in Yiddish, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And just by reading the title, I didn't mean to say that immunotherapy is a disease. Uh, that might sound like. Um, so I have no disclosures. Uh, my question was, where should I begin? And maybe at the beginning. So this is an antibody. It has... Uh, 
can have a heavy chain and a light chain. Uh, each one of them has a variable region and a constant region. And at first, everything starts with the stem cell. So first, there was a stem cell. And then he decided to develop into something else, in this case, into B cell. And B cell goes through several differentiation steps, uh, which I never can never remember the pro pre and all this stuff, but we can actually divide it into three steps. The first step is rearrangement, rearranging uh, the heavy chain, and by the end of the first step, then we get uh, the pre-B cell receptor, which means there is something presented, or presented on the surface of the B cell. The second step will be rearranging uh, the light chain, and by the end of this step, we'll uh, end up with the immature B cells, which then go on to develop into immature B cells. And this is a more complicated way to demonstrate the same thing. Uh, so starting with rearrangement of the variable chain and joining it to the constant uh, region of the heavy chain. And by the end of this phase, uh, phase we've got three B cell receptor, which means, again, something is presented on the B cell. Uh, but this is not a light chain. This is a surrogate light chain. The second step will be uh, rearrangement of the light chain, and by the end of this step, uh, we have the immature B cell which has a BCR on it, and this BCR is an IgM antibody. So the first step uh, begins at the bone marrow, and that's why B cells are called B cells because they are being produced in the bone marrow. Uh, by the end of the first step, the immature B cell undergoes some kind of selection, which means it's being presented with self-antigen. And if it recognizes this cell antigen, then it will be uh, eliminated. Then the mature B cells go on, go out to the periphery. It goes to the spleen, the lymph node, all the secondary lymph node organs, uh, where it actually wait to meet his cognate antigen. And once it meets his antigen, antigen, then it can de develop further into a plasma cell and memory B cell. But that's not the end of the story. So after we've got the antibody, and the antibody was and we got the B cell. The B cell actually met his cognate antigen and is ready to develop and produce more antibodies. Then it undergoes, undergoes several other modifications. Um, two of them are called somatic acro mutation and gene conversion, um, which basically meant to see or to try and create a more effective antibody, uh, which will have higher affinity to the antigen and will be able to produce a more effective immune response. And the other modification is class switching, which means that the antibody actually changed its heavy chain. Its, its heavy chain. Um, so we have five uh, classes of antibodies based on the heavy chain. We have the IgM, IgD, IgG, IgE, and IgA. And we also have subclasses. So we have uh, four IgG subclasses, um, one, two, three, and four, and two IgA <coughs> subclasses, one and two. And the question is, how does the B cell decide what it want, what, what it want to be when it grows up? Uh, or what affects uh, the class switch? Um, so just for your notice, when we talk about mouse, then the human IgG4 in mouse is IgG1. And obviously, all the B cells are affected by cytokines. And the cytokine, which uh, cause these Excuse me? Yeah, that's the animation. <laughs> So IgG1, which in this case, uh, we're speaking about the mouse, so this is the IgG4 and IgE, are both affected by the same cytokines. So IL4 induces both IgG4 and IgE. And I think if there is some confusion between IgE and IgG4, and this is something that we usually see in clinic, we uh, talk about it later on, uh, but that could be part of it. And they also have, are inhibited by the same uh, cytokine by interferon. So this is the two, TH2 response with IL4. This is the 2H1 response. TH2 drives IgG4 and IgE, and TH1 actually suppress IgG4 and IgE. And that was the basic, I mean, that's, if you can see, this is the, this picture was taken from uh, January, the textbook for 2008, but actually this is true for 1990, uh, when it was first described. So. Actually, what this uh, group was doing, they took B cells, put them in wells, and tried to stimulate them with different cytokines. So you can see here, if you take the B cell without any cytokines, you won't get any, uh, any IG, IgG4, you won't get any IgE, but if you add IG, IL, IL4 to the uh, solution, then, we get, uh, then IgG4 and IgE will be secreted. Um, there was also spontaneous uh, secretion of IgG1 and IgG2, 
which had nothing to do with IL-4, so that was like a background secretion, but the major effect was with IL, with IgG4 and IgE. Um, and actually, if, we, if they added anti-IL-4 on or interferon gamma, they, can, they could actually suppress this secretion of both IgG4 and IgE. But eight years later, there is some change in the understanding of uh, uh, the differentiation into IgG4 and IgE, so no longer IL-4, now it is IL-10. So if we add IL-10, then we can actually differentiate between IgE and IgG4, which means if we we'll add IL-10, then the IgE secretion will be actually uh, abolished and the IgG4 secretion will be increased. But in order to get this uh, secretion of IgG4 uh, and to shut down the IgE secretion, we also need IL-4 which means we need two cytokines, one IL-4 to prime the B cells, and then add to that, on that, the IL-10. So IL-10 plus IL-4 equals IgG, or IL-14, uh, and that's a joke. Um, and if, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, and if you check, if it was checked in uh, sensitized uh, or allergic patients who were allergic to dust mite, so similar response was uh, demonstrated only uh, it was uh, more pronounced when the cells were stimulated both with IL-4 and uh, the antigen, in this case the dust mite uh, antigen, and again the same reaction. So adding IL-10 actually suppressed IgE, adding uh, IL-10 to IL-4 B cell, IL-4 prime B cell, and uh, increased IgG4 production. Uh, but there is a lot, uh, another thing that they actually found, that if you start there's also a question on when you add the IL-10 to the B cell. So if the B cell are primed with IL-4, um, and if you add IL-10 immediately uh, after the cell are incubated, then we'll get very high IgG4 secretion um, and no IgE secretion. But if we add the IL-10 after several days, in this case four days, then we'll get higher secretion of IgE and lower secretion of IgG4. And I was thinking that some of us are concerned of starting immunotherapy during the allergy season and I, that actually might be the part of the reason, because when we, during the allergy season, I guess that all B cells are already primed. They have they are IL-4 prime, because there is uh, a more uh, aggressive Th2 response. And then if we start immunotherapy, and I'll talk about it later, then we might get IL-10, and then we'll get the higher Ig level. Uh, so that theoretically might explain uh, the risk. So I would like to talk about some characteristics of IgG4. And I guess that whenever a B cell decides to switch from one class to another, there is some reason for that. I don't know what is the reason. But if you, just from a quick overview of the properties of IgG4, it doesn't sound like a very big anti uh, antibody. It is able to neutralize uh, the antigen, which is good, but it has very low sanitization properties, um, doesn't sensitize mast cell, which is not an obvious thing. It does activate complement and found in very low levels in the serum. Uh, but there are some unique uh, properties. Uh, one of them is that IgG4 is considered to be uh, B-specific antibodies. So I think all antibodies were born equal, which means they have the same uh, fab region where they are first produced. But then later on, people actually saw that if you try to uh, cross-link solid and liquid antigen uh, with IgG4, they couldn't do that. On another experiment after that, what people try to do is take two antigens or two allergens, uh, put one of them on a solid uh, surface, another one in a liquid form, and then they actually could, could cross-link the two antigens, which led to the assumption that IgG4 are bispecific antibodies, uh, which are generated by exchange of the IgG4 half molecules. And that was just an assumption for many years, until 2007, uh, when and more sophisticated experiments were done. So what was done that two uh, recombinant monoclonal IgG4 antibodies were uh, generated. One of them was directed against the breach pollen. The other one was directed against a cat allergen. Uh, and then uh, they were injected into nude mice. Uh, and after 24, 48 hours, you can see that if you calculate the percent of the B-specific antibodies, which has one arm, directed again the pollen, uh, the breach, and another arm directed again the cap, then almost 50% of uh, the antibodies was, were uh, bispecific. They tried to dilute it, to dilute it with adding 20-fold irrelevant IgG4, 
And again, a relative decrease in the B-specific antibodies was uh, observed. They did the same thing with IgG1 and no effect, so no exchange. So the uh, FAB arm exchange is something which is uh, specific or unique for the IgG4 antibodies. Uh, and that probably was the reason why IgG4 can cross-link antigens. Um, and it was assumed that it can actually cross or block cross-linking by other antibodies. So that was not the only thing they did. They did David, some... I'm sorry, you, one of the operations in that study was to make a recombinant by yes. specific molecule. Are you saying that that by specific molecule is made naturally as well? No, they made one like that. One of the antibodies was against Birch, and one of them against the cat, and yeah. then they mixed them together. But, but actually, the IgG4 does do that naturally uh, as well. IgG, it does. It does that. Exactly. Naturally. I just wanted to prove that. And you, that just, was, you just made a. That was the thing. That, the only was that was the first time it was actually proven. Okay. Uh, and, and that was not that long ago. It's 2007, even though it was speculated years before. So you only need one half of uh, the specific antibody to recognize the antigen. You don't need both halves. No, yeah. you can bind. I mean, you have to. Yeah. The question is whether or not you can induce some effect by cross-linking other, uh, uh, cross-linking the antigen on other cells. That's another question. But that is something they also they test. Uh, they, they also tested. Um, so after they they saw that the IgG4 can uh, create by specific antibodies, they actually asked the question: Does it have any effect? In, vi in vivo. So they used the primate model, they were very bad people, uh, of myasthenia gravis, uh, in which antibodies against that acetylcholine receptor uh, actually induce muscle weakness. So two uh, antibodies were generated, one of them was IgG1 and the second one was IgG4. And if they injected the IgG1, uh, then they induced the disease, the monkeys became very weak after several days. And if they injected IgG4, then no effect uh, was observed. But if they inject them together, then it actually could prevent the disease. Which means that IgG4 has something, some way to interfere with uh, IgG1 binding. Um, so they went back to the in vitro studies and they checked if, uh, what is the effect of IgG on uh, acetylcholine receptor on uh, in an in vitro study, which means that they took cells which expressed the acetylcholine receptors, they incubated them with the antibodies, and then they checked um, for down regulation to see if you get some down regulation of the receptor. And now if the antibody can actually cross link the receptor, then you get down regulation. So that's the, the monospecific, monovalent, or the bispecific effect. So by using uh, IgG1, they can actually uh, induce down regulation of the receptor. If they use uh, uh, recombinant IgG4, then they could downregulate the receptor. But then, if they use uh, IgG4, which was injected to the monkeys prior to that, assuming that some fab exchange uh, uh, had happened, uh, then they could prevent uh, downregulation of the receptor. So, this is, if you can see here, that's without any antibodies. After they added the IgG1, they could downregulate the surface uh, acetylcholine receptor. And if they add serum from monkeys who are injected uh, with IgG4, uh, they can pre prevent down regulation. So the bottom line was that IgG4 acquired a non cross linking and protective activity in vivo. But again, if we think about our side of the equation with allergy, we usually speak about Ig, we don't speak about IgG1. So the question is is there any relevance to our uh, disease? At all? Um, other features uh, of IgG4, it has very poor interaction with all the FC gamma receptors, both the activating and the inhibitory receptors. It, it, it poorly binds a uh, complement, and I think uh, that was an interesting paper mostly because of these two guys. This is Jeffrey Hill and this is Herman Baldman, and I think they were not interested in IgG4 at all. They were on this interested in this antibody, which is the CAMPAT, the anti-CD52, and they wanted to show how effective it is uh, by activating complement, but the side product was showing that human IgG4 couldn't uh, activate complement. Uh, and another way later was to actually check and to see if uh, cells which, are, which bind IgG4 can uh, also bind C1Q, and there was no C1Q binding. And the last uh, thing I would like to talk about is the slow development. So IgG4 develops after recurrent or repeated exposure. And this is a beekeeper study um, in which they followed beekeepers starting from the first year of the work and then 
repeatedly checked the serum uh, after that, so that started in 78, and the last check in 91, three to four year period, and, and their conclusion was that the contribution of IgG4 antibodies uh, to the antigen binding um, was low at first and increased with time and assumed with the number of these things. So with, with repeated exposure, we get higher IgG, uh, IgG levels. That's just the total level of IgG. IgG. That, now that's the PLA binding IgG, so we're that antigen specific IgG. Right, that's right. Do you, you know why those kinetics are different? Why it's slow? Uh... No. I think they know it's slow. David, you've done all this against IgG1. Is there any correlation with G2 or G3 in this, or have they just they ignored them? They didn't check IgG1. They didn't check IgG2 and IgG3. I think they, they wanted, I mean, it was maybe more easily to produce an, I, an antibody against that tetracycline receptor when these are the properties of the different antigen, which either they bind polysaccharide or uh, peptide. So that, maybe that's the reason they chose IgG1. Uh, so this is just a table to summarize the properties of uh, IgG4. Its biologic target is protein antigen. It is usually or by specific functionally, but by specific, um, it's found in very low concentration, relatively low concentration, half-life like every other IgG antibodies. It doesn't bind complement, and it doesn't bind usually, it does not bind the, the IgG receptor. According to that, though, it's not the only one that has that bivalent function. Other subclasses are listed IgG3, for everyone. IgG3, tetravalent, bivalent, yes. <coughs> uh, I always thought it was a property of subclass four. And nobody actually mentioned it. Oh, bivalent, bivalent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So it is the only one that has That's that property? That's the only one that is specific. And that was some concern. I mean, some of the uh, therapeutic antibodies are made uh, or IgG4, so there was some concern at one point that if you use some, uh, I mean, some antibodies which are supposed to suppress or block some receptor, then if you have one arm which is directed against your target, target antigen and then the other arm could actually bind some pathogen, then you might actually infect the cells with uh, some undesired effect of some of the therapeutic antibodies, but it wasn't, never was shown. You know, just briefly on that, it's curious, the ones that he showed that IgG4 can prevent myasthenia gravis. And then he would try therapeutics like that, making monoclonal antibodies. Not that I know. Just inject high dose of IgG4. Maybe. Or for allergies as well. Yes. So IgG4 in immunotherapy, um, does it have an active role or just a side effect? And the answer is that I don't know. I really don't know. Um, so if you check different studies about immunotherapy, then almost every study uh, checked the IgG4 level over time as a marker for um, the effective, effectiveness of the immunotherapy. And if you follow the references, then almost all of them lead to two papers, one of the two, both of them from 1976, uh, which actually describe elevation in the IgG4 levels after immunotherapy uh, to grass pollen. This is the first one. This is the second one. Same, uh, same observation, increasing both specific IgG and IgE antibodies were seen after treatment in most patients. The subclass's predominant response was for IgG1 and IgG4 antibodies. Uh, and this is repeatedly uh, cited. And uh, recently we saw, we also the New, England, the New England Journal of Medicine paper about oral immunotherapy for egg allergy in children. And they also, one of the things that they measured was the egg-specific IgG4 antibody and the egg-specific IgE antibodies. And what uh, they were saying that the higher uh, IgG level uh, was correlated with desensitization and also predicted desensitization later on, which means actually IgG4 has some effect. And the question is whether it's true or not, or is it just a side effect. And if you check their supplemental material, then you can see that almost all patients who were treated with oral immunotherapy had some increase in their IgG4 level. Um, and some people failed the oral therapy, some kids actually were, uh, have passed the challenge later on. But you can see that in both groups you can see patients with very high level of IgG4. And I would assume that if IgG4 actually played an active role, um, then you would have, you will get some kind of cutoff. Some, so above certain level of IgG4, you could prevent the disease like in myasthenia gravis. Um, and I think the only way to show that IgG4 actually has a protective effect would be to use passive immunization, like you suggested. Give somebody IgG4 and see what the effect is. So that was tried recently. 
David, on that chart, on that study, did they look at the level of IgE? Yes. And the correlate IG it with uh, IgG4? Yes, it was less. I mean, it wasn't, you didn't see as much. The p-value was uh, not significant in 10 months. It was significant later on. But there is, you can see that if you start with a, a 10 months, they checked the kids who passed the annual challenge test and those who didn't. So you can see that the Ig, IgG4 level is more significantly higher than uh, I mean, the difference between IgG4 and IgE, um, there is a difference. You can mostly see increase in IgG4, uh, only slight increases uh, or slight decrease. You would expect to see a decrease in IgE. And then later on, again, the same increase in IgG4, some decrease uh, in IgE level, and at 24 months, so again, significant increase uh, in IgG4, and not that significant decrease in IgE. Yes. Yes. Did they look at the ovomucoid, ovomucoid IgE as well? No. I don't think they did. Maybe somebody in the audience said they did, but I don't think they did. So the passive, passive immunization was actually tried uh, recently, and that was in 1935. Um, so brave people, what they did, they took uh, 20 uh, donors, 20... Uh, patient who were allergic uh, to grass, um, and then they took blood donation from the 20 patient, the 20 donors, uh, the donors were treated with immunotherapy and then uh, transfused it into allergic patient, and that patient actually reported some improvement in their symptoms. So during four to six weeks after that, they had a very great, uh, very good uh, Pollen season, no symptoms, fear of symptoms, so actually uh, passive immunization or transfer of something, we don't know what it is, uh, help their symptoms. Uh, so people were inspired, I guess, by this uh, experiment. So recently after that, that was in 78, uh, somebody else tried similar or in a way similar things. So 12 patients allergic to honeybees uh, were challenged by injection of bee venom. Five responded systemically. Again, very brave people. Um, and these patients were given intramuscular or IV gamma globulin uh, from plasma of uh, beekeepers who were not allergic. They didn't go any, they didn't get any immunotherapy, but they were not allergic. Um, and post infusion, the same patient were cha challenged again with the venom, uh, with the ven with venom, and this time they could tolerate much higher dose of the venom. Um, and again, so there's results show that something was protective in the immunoglobulin which were injected. We don't know what it is. Uh, and these are the best re uh, results. These results represent the best available evidence for direct well for IgG blocking antibodies. And up to date, this is still the best evidence for blocking antibodies. Nobody tried that uh, since. Um, so this is another. I wasn't planning. I wasn't planning to draw of all, uh, all this slide, but this is basically what happens with uh, the allergic response. So we start with sensitization. An, ant an antigen is presented by the vitic cell. It drives all the Th2 response with a lot of IgE secretion. Other Th cells, mast cells, are being activated later on, um, and other cells are recruited. Um, and I think we can expect IgG4 to block all these uh, events. So it will be a big job for one antigen to do. And so the current concept today about immunotherapy is that Tregs are playing a major role. Um, so they block the B cell, they block the Th2 response, and they also later on block the basophil recruitment and eosinophil recruitment and downregulate or quiet the mast cell activation as well. And the way they do that is by secreting IL-10 and TGF-beta. And this is the same IL-10 which produced the IgG4 or induced the IgG4. Um, but this IL-10 also suppress Ig and support IgG1, IgG4, and Ig. And if we can follow the level of the ID, uh, different immunoglobulin over time with immunotherapy, then we saw uh, initial increase in the Ig level. Again, if we can remember what I told, if you can remember what I told you several minutes ago, then when you get an IL-4 prime B cell, the first response will be. Uh, 2 IL-10 will be increasing the level of IgE, so this is, could be the explanation for the initial um, increase in IgE levels. And then over time, there is a gradual increase in IgG4, very slow over time. 
So what are the potential, tolerat potential tolerizing effects of IgG4? We think that these are neutralizing antibodies. We show, I showed you, I showed you some data about uh, how IgG4 can block IgG1, but I don't know if they're actually found in the same place. I mean, IgG, IgE is found on body surface with IgG4 in all the other places, and I don't know if it's actually available to block the antigen once it, once it's been presented. Um, definitely doesn't bind the FC, uh, the inhibitory FC gamma receptor. Um, and I don't think that it can block all other TH2 effects. But there was one study which I found which might suggest that it can actually interact with, uh, with IG binding. Uh, so grass pollen immunotherapy uh, induced mucosa and peripheral alten response and blocking IgG activity. Uh, they took patients who were treated for two years uh, with immunotherapy to grass. Um, and then they tried to block uh, the binding of IgE to B cell uh, with different uh, component of the serum. So if they uh, added Ig to the serum and the pollen antigen, uh, then you could find, you could see increased binding of the complex to the B cell. And um, if they added uh, serum for immunotherapy, a patient, they could block that effect. If they added only the IgG fraction of the same serum, they could block the effect. And Ig serum uh, without uh, IgG4 couldn't block that effect. So IgG4 can actually do something with the interaction uh, of IgG4 with Ig complexes. And the assumption was that it mediated through binding to CD23. They didn't think that actually IgG4 block IgE binding, but they assumed that IgG4 could uh, interfere with allergen presentation to T cells. So if you block the binding of IgG4 or Ig, I'm sorry, to CD23, B cells are great antigen presenter cells, and if you can block that binding, you won't have uh, ongoing presentation, and maybe in that way you can suppress the immune response. That's it. Yeah. Any questions so far? Because I think we're okay with time. Uh, so this is the uh, recommendation of the Quad AI. Um, during immunotherapy, level of specific IgG1, IgG4, and IgA increase, and there is no point in measuring the levels. So there is no indication to measure that. But if you read some papers uh, which were written by Alvarez, and this is the guy, um, I mean, every paper with IgG4 has his name on it, his name on it. So he's the number one expert, I think, in IgG4. And actually, he suggests that increased IgG1 to IgG4 uh, ratio, uh, not the end ratio from below 20% to above 80% is typical for su successful conventional immunotherapy. So, in a way, he also suggested in one of his papers that if you don't find any increase in the IgG1 to IgG4 ratio and the patient doesn't have any benefits, so that might be an indication to stop the immunotherapy. Uh, but again, it is not recommended by the quad AI. Yeah. There's an IgG4 on top and yeah. an IgG1 on the bottom yeah. on the ratio. The IgG, yes. Thank you. It is IgG4 to IgG1. Are there any statements? What I always wonder is, it would be nice to have a biomarker as to know when to stop immunotherapy. And I know Steve Durham in London has been trying to work on a bioassay for that. Have you come across anything using this level or this ratio to say enough immunotherapy that you're tolerant? Um, no, I didn't see something to suggest. Uh, but Steve, I mean, he, he was working, I read some of his paper, and again, he was working about. Uh, some of the data I think that was presented, this is his data actually, which demonstrates the, the ability to block CD23 presentation or IG uh, binding to B cells. Uh, but I didn't see, I didn't really think about when to stop immunotherapy. So this is the, the Yiddish part that you promised everyone. So as my grandmother used to say, there are some tumors which mean problems. Um, and the problems are always presented in a very nice way. So this is one example uh, for understanding IgG4 food sensitivities. Uh, and if you read through what, this is just one example, but it sounds pretty convincing. And obviously this guy, somebody, the one who wrote that, is well aware of the literature and knows all, everything about IgG4. Uh, so some slight uh, misunderstandings or incorrect data. So there are several types of food and adverse reaction. There is the food allergy, uh, which trigger muscle. And this, is, this can be caused by either IgG or IgE. 
Uh, food sensitivity is purely an immune system mediated response involving various classes of food specific immunoglobulin molecules. And there are the food intolerances. Uh, I mean, there are crazy people out there. We don't treat them, they have something else. Um, and the explanation is that IgG4 immune complex formation, IgG4 actually, uh, uh, so IgG4 makes immune complex formation. So they know everything about the class which IgG1 antibody produce will class which to IgG4. And that is right. Interestingly, IgG4 antigen com uh, complexes do not activate complement cascade. We know that, that's right. IgG4 acts as a blocking agent against the action of IgE, could be, and can form small complexes as antigen exposure increases. These IgG4 food immune complexes have relatively long half-life, it's the same as every other IgG, and are subject to alternation, subject to alternation that would affect the structure enough to present as a new antigen. And this is where things are becoming kind of imaginary. Uh, it is thought that IgG1 is then produced to attack its complex, and thus begins a whole new cycle, IgG1, IgG4 complex modification, and then we got the immune response. Uh, Where did this come from? Where did this, come from? this is a, just a brochure. A, some, some brochure that was out there. Yeah. And if you can search the internet, you can find it. So, so the naturopaths do? Yeah, it's from the marketing. So if you, if you read something like that, then we can say we can dismiss that and that's nothing. But if you go through the literature, you can find, you can find other things as well. Uh, Food-specific IgG4 antibody-guided exclusion diet improves symptoms and rectal compliance in IBS uh, patients. And if they check food-specific serum IgG and IgE titers to common food antigen in irritable bowel syndrome, then you can find higher levels of IgG4 uh, compared to normal controls. I didn't calculate uh, the statistics, <coughs> but I think that, let's say for wheat, zero plus minus 285 and plus minus 1000 won't, be, won't have any p-value, but I didn't check that. Um, and these are all published in the same group which, were doing this, uh, which was doing these studies. And another study, food-specific IgG4 guided exclusion diet improved symptoms in Crohn's disease, a pilot study, so 40 Crohn's disease patients. Inclusion of, four, uh, of the four most reactive foods which had the highest IgG4 against them for four weeks and the questionnaire inflammatory markers were followed. So 90% reported symptomatic improvement and there was a fall uh, in the ESR from 23 to 17. Uh, I actually wrote them an email after that asking what was the long-term effect uh, of the diet, but I didn't get any response. Uh, these yet. are peer-reviewed articles. Yes, and these are, I think these are reasonable journal. That's, I don't know how reasonable, that's Scandinavia Journal of Gastroenterology, and this one, American Journal of Gastroenterology. Uh, the last one was, uh, I don't know why, but it was also a reasonable journal. Uh, so that, that makes that some kind of a problem, and I mean, you read the things, and obviously I was taught to think differently, but maybe what if they are right, and we are wrong, so and some, some doubts uh, while reviewing the literature. And then there are other people which will more likely will be more glad to read their papers, so somebody actually checked that, they checked if IG, the ITG4 and IDG antibodies in subjects with IBS, um, this time it's not 25 patients, and these are 269 patients, and no significant difference in regard to food and any specific IgG. Final conclusion, our findings suggest that IgG4 and IgG uh, mediated food and yeast hypersensitivity is unlikely. Uh, and IgG antibody actually reflects what we eat. Likes the diet, yeah. And uh, that was followed, I mean, that wasn't followed, but uh, there is a, a position paper from the European Society, uh, which was saying the truth, the way we see that, that there is a lot of money in it, and you'll get many positive results without any corresponding clinical symptoms, so just don't do that. And IgG4 actually reflects the, the normal diet of the individual. And this same, um, same position was uh, later adopted by the quality. <coughs> but I think the European were saying that um, up front, and that, that's the fact. There's a lot of money in there, don't test that. Um, and the same paper, uh, in this position, in review paper, I mean, sorry, in this position paper, they also checked uh, different IgGs to different foods um, in 100 healthy kids, and also in another, uh, from another paper, in 30, 13 healthy uh, people, and just 
so you know, so bananas, um, most of the people will have very high, will have high levels of IgG4 against bananas. Um, and the reason is that there is some lectin in the bananas which calls for non-specific binding for IgG4. So if the next time we see a patient with the IgG4 sheet, just check for the bananas and see if it's very high. Uh, I mean, isn't it true that, I mean, measuring IgG4 and specific IgG4 is a very tough thing to do? It is, because IgG4 time. binds non-specifically. Yeah. So there's, you need to add a non-specific IgG to the solution to prevent that, right. to okay. create some blocking effect. Yes, and I don't know if everybody knows that. I remember learning that. in residency that most labs don't do that. And most, I don't know if you do that very or not. But if you do need to block that, because yeah. there is very high non-specific uh, non binding. Like the motivation of the companies that do this on a mass scale is to sell as much as possible. And so the same companies that we rely on for Immunicap, specific IgE, are doing this, and they're probably making more money off of this. And so it's a, there's a very uh, big market pressure to continue offering this and putting it in the hands of patients. As it's obviously scientifically off base, but... Um, I mean, but they don't care if it's accurate. I mean, no, they actually don't. Right. Okay. <laughs> the patient, they, they just care that it's that it's, it's legal to, yeah. to sell it. That's all. That, that's their motivation. And the problem is that there are patients with symptoms which we can't explain. So somebody, somebody has to explain that in some way. Uh, that's, right. Yeah, but the, the point is we can't just reject it as not existing because even though it's maybe wrong. You know, it's it's just part of what we're no, going to deal with. We have to say time. that we know that this is part of the normal response. So if you eat something repeatedly, then that will be the normal immunological response. That will be should be our bottom line. So you'll, if you'll check that, then you will find IgG4, and <clears throat> all the antibodies are there to protect us. And the IgG4 actually reflects a normal immunological response, which means that you're a healthy person, and that's not the cause for your symptoms. That's what I tell patients. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think there are <laughs> implications for back. measuring IgG4, like in the autoimmune fibrosis diseases. And when, you know, I saw a number of those in residency, and again, you have to send it to one of a couple of specialized labs to actually measure it accurately is what I was taught, because if you just kind of measure IgG4, a lot of labs don't do it properly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be interesting if our, you know, like in the academy or something it could uh, sponsor a study where you do, you know, 10 measurements to the same lab of blood drawn on different days from the same person <laughs> and then and then calculate if there's any you know sense to it at all with, with those especially the the foods that are less reliable you know because it seems like wheat and and milk eggs milk up, and, wheat. and eggs are always up and that's the part i tell patients i say well there may be something to excluding those from your diet because so many people say they get better, but it may, I don't think it has anything to do with these right. test results. Right. Right. Dave, I'm mean, having things as distressing as you had some papers in what we would consider good peer-reviewed journals that tended to support that. I had not seen that before, and for those who are advocates in this, to be able to point to call it the literature and say, validated in your own scientific method. They weren't blind to control, though. No, no. They were so there, you can always say that. Uh, Matt brought up it's, uh, it's measuring IgG subclass four and autoimmune disease. I don't know anything about that. He's He's come across that. that. Tell me if you got the IgG four. He's going to get to it. Take it before you move on. What about the patient who comes in with their IgG four food testing and everything's zero except for one food? I mean, if you say it reflects a diet, how does that? How do you explain that? You see that doesn't have any immune deficiency. So you don't you didn't come across any of that literature because the GI guys are desperate to understand eosinophilic bowel disease. I didn't and they use the, this as a test, just like everything else. Yeah, I mean, they're desperate to yeah. find something. I don't know. I didn't see any some anyone to suggest that Ig specific food Ig levels are associated with was in feeding disorders. Yeah. Again, you're, you're arguing maybe it's not specific because everybody's high on the banana, for example. Yes, but that's not true. If you look at enough of but that's people, specific. when they bring this craziness in, and you look at it a yeah. lot, yeah. you don't see banana. You see yeah. eggs, milk, and wheat sort of every time. Yeah. Because this is right. something that you eat in your diet. Maybe in your here you don't eat a lot of bananas. In different places you eat a lot of bananas. So it will actually reflect what you eat. And you eat a lot of eggs, a lot of wheat. That's the major things you have in your diet. So that's why you'll have the high IgG4 for that. But that makes sense, except for the fact that we eat a lot of stuff a lot of the time, and we only make one antibody that doesn't go with that theory very well. I didn't see much. We have only one antibody. Okay. And I think if, if I mean, 
if you find only, only, only one antibody, I think it will make sense to check for IgE as well. Uh, well, some of the labs will actually give you both, and, yeah. the, and because they're the ones that I like yeah, to look side at. Side. So they're side by side. Well, they know. give you this report yeah. right here is what yeah. you get. But I don't even believe them. the IgE on well, it. That's yeah. the thing. I think yeah. it makes sense. The same IL-4 <laughs> stimulations, because IL-4 induce both I, IgG4 and IgE. So if you get only elevated IgG4 level for only one food, I will check IgE as well to see if you don't have elevated IgE. And that, in that case, you might have some symptoms which are due to the IgE, not due to the IgG4. But that's what the that bottom graph shows you. No, yeah, but you're talking about other things. I mean, these people had a lot of IgG4. Um, you talking never, about specific uh, patients. This is a yes. topic for another time. Yeah. Let's, let's let him move on to yeah. back to science and not conjecture. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we can call it science. <laughs> use it, use it. <laughs> Uh, bananas. Uh, bananas. Bananas. Are so bananas. Yes, you know, have no bananas. My grandmother, the same one, the grandmother with the tourists, always told me to eat a lot of bananas because it will make you stronger. And I guess the, she knew that it would use high IgG4 protective level. Uh, but she didn't know about IgG4 related disease. And it's not her fault because nobody knew about IgG4 related disease back then. Um, and we usually consider IgG4 as an anti inflammatory antibody. Uh, but it is not. The truth, because we know it already. We already know that it involved in other diseases. So we get we have IgG4, which mediated pemphigus vulgaris. IgG4 immune complexes in subset of membranous glomerular nephritis, and in TTP there are IgG4 antibodies against the metalloproteas. And so IgG, but when we speak about IgG4 related diseases, these are different diseases, and this is not these uh, three known uh, diseases. And these are increasingly recognized fiber inflammatory condition of unknown etiology yet. So we speak about collection of disorder which, uh, which share specific pathological, serological, and clinical features. Um, usually people develop tumor-like swelling of some organs uh, and on biopsy we'll see dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate which are supposed to be rich in IgG4 positive plasma cell uh, and variable degree of fibrosis. Um, elevated serum IgG4 are common, but they are not always there. Which diet are you mean? Like, non-organized. Non oh. So the first description was back in 2001, that was from Japan. A unique form of chronic pancreatitis characterized by infrequent, infrequent attacks of abdominal pain, and irregular narrowing of the pancreatic duct. This is specific uh, phenotype or something unique to the uh, autoimmune uh, pancreatitis, uh, IgG4 pancreatitis, and swelling of the pancreatic parenchyma. It had a different name back then, so sclerosing pancreatitis, primary inflammatory pancreatitis, and so on. Uh, but when it was first described, again, whatever the name is, uh, the patient had higher serum le IgG levels. They decided on a cutoff of 135. The normal range that we usually use is uh, 140. Uh, and you can see that if uh, you check the IgG4 level, and compare it to other pancreatic diseases, pancreatic cancer, uh, chronic pancreatitis, so the sclerosing pancreatitis or the autoimmune pancreatitis uh, patient had higher uh, IgG4 level. And two years later, this is not, no longer just a pancreatic disease, now it's a systemic disease. So eight patients with autoimmune pancreatitis were studied. Um, in many cases, patients are presented with obstructive jaundice and because of the tissue swelling, obviously pancreatic cancer is suspected. So this patient underwent a WIPEL procedure, so many uh, organs were available for pathologic evaluation. And what uh, was noticed that in many, many organs you see severe or moderate infiltration of IgG plasma cell with T cell, both CD4 and CD8, and that was found that, uh, in the pancreas. That's supposed to be the liver, this is the gastric mucosa, colonic mucosa, but also in the bone marrow um, and lymph nodes. Uh, and this is the name which uh, you can see over and over again when you go through the literature of IgG4 related disease. And now, today, we know that we can find similar pathological uh, features in different organs. So, Mikulic syndrome, which affects salivary and, uh, salivary and lacrimal glands, Kutner syndrome, salmonibular glands, renal thyroiditis, and so on. And one of them is also the retroperitoneal fibrosis, because for me, before that, IgG4 disease was autoimmune pancreatitis and retroperitoneal fibrosis, and that's it. So actually every organ can be affected, and in many cases this is not only confined to one organ, but it is a multi-organ, multi-system disease. 
Uh, these are some pictures which are not of pancreatic tissue, uh, which propped is of the eyes, here and here, here as well, submandibular lymph lymphadenopathy, mm -hmm. submandibular lymphadenopathy, and also the pancreas should be seen here in large, I guess it is pancreas, and also kidney involvement. Uh, so what are the histological features of IgG4 related disease? Uh, elevated IgG4 in the serum and the tissue are helpful, but are not, you don't have to find them. So that's kind of confusing. And key morphologic features include dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, obliterative phlebitis, this is something which is unique to the disease, mild to moderate, moderate eosinophil infiltrates, uh, formation of an inflammatory mass, uh, which can actually destroy the involved organ, you don't see neutrophils, you don't see any granulomas, um, and again, even though you don't have, they don't have to be there, you need to see IgG4 staining. So this is kind of confusing. Um, and these are uh, some histological uh, pictures. So dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrates uh, from otitis, um, and the arrow points to obliterative phlebitis. Um, story from fibrosis in lacrimal gland, so this is the fibrosis which is not very organized. Um, you can see positive staining for IgG4, this is otitis, and this is again the lacrimal gland, and this is the obl obliterative phlebitis, so this is the vein, it's totally occluded, and these are the margins. And you can also find eosinophils in there, plasma cells, and fibroblasts. Do you think this is primary or secondary, or do they have evidence? That's a good question. Uh, I assume these are orphan, or orphan disease. It's really small numbers of people. Small number. Yes. Are there any cases of IgG4 lymphomas? Um, IgG4 myeloma, you mean? Myeloma, uh, lymphoma. I think uh, there are some cases. It's not very common, I think. Um, but this is not a lymphoma. Um, so... I'm sure there is, but it's not very common. It's not associated with these diseases. So, so the highly differentiated. So, so there is one now. So there's some, confu there some confusion about the IgG4 because if you read through different articles, high level of IgG, high IgG serum levels are helpful but are not diagnostic. And it actually says that say that tissue IgG plasma cell uh, can cause from misdiagnosis because if, if you overlook for them and you don't see them, then you might suggest that this is not the right diagnosis. So I guess you don't have to be to see them. But then on another paper, you can read that histological appearance, though highly characteristic, requires confirmation of the staining for IgG4. So they do have to be there. Um, and actually, you can find IgG4 plasma cell in different diseases as well, which includes sarcoidosis, Kassaman disease, stroke, Strauss, lymphoma, and also um, in the inflammation tissue, which surrounds no plastic lesion, including pancreatic cancer. So that's, I think, the worst case scenario. You see a patient, you take a biopsy with obstructive jaundice, you take a biopsy, you find his IgG plasma cell, IgG4 plasma cell, and you tell him that everything is okay, and then that was part of the inflammation which surrounded uh, the, the malignant uh, tissue, and you will have pancreatic cancer. So kind of confusing and need uh, some specific attention or special attention. Uh, and in order to try and explain this contradiction between IgG4, it to be there, it doesn't have to be there. So uh, there are suggested diagnostic criteria. It should be confirmed by a biopsy. In the biopsy, we should see three uh, major things. These are dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrates, storyform fibrosis, obliterative phlebitis, and as far as it concerns the IgG4 plasma cell, so 30 IgG4 positive plasma cell per high power field and IgG4 to IgG ratio, and this time it's on the right, the right written in the right way, should be above 50%. So what is the mechanism of uh, this IgG4? Um, nobody knows. Uh, so genetic predisposition was observed. Uh, some HLA class 2 uh, molecules were more common. And there was some polymorphism in the CTLA-40 and F-alpha, FC receptor-like uh, 3. Uh, molecular mimicry was also assumed because there were some similar similarities between H. pyloric proteins to pancreatic enzymes, but the pancreas is not always involved in this disease. Um, and autoimmunity, so several target peptides were, were suggested, including carbonic anhydrase, trypsin, and trypsin again, and trypsin again, and trypsin inhibitor, but that was not confirmed yet. And then again, we go to the same, uh, same explanation, like immunotherapy, of Th2 response and regulatory immune reaction. So Th2 response is dominant response in the affected cells. 
um, they have I, IL-4, IL-5, IL-10, IL-13 levels. And if you check peripheral uh, monocyte, peripheral blood monocyte, then they also secrete TH2 cytokines. And as a result from these IL-4 and IL-5, there's an and elevated IG levels is also common. Uh, and as far as you're concerned to the regulatory uh, cytokines, so there is also high FOXP3 expression, high numbers of CD4, CD25 T-rigs in the blood, and again, overexpression of IL-10, TGF, beta, which induce the IgG4. So again, is IgG4 a cause or just a response to the inflammation? Uh, we don't know that. And there are diff very nice studies which actually checked MR ex uh, MR uh, uh, mRNA expression in the tissue itself. Uh, this, this is taken from salivary glands, and they compared the expression uh, in IgG4 disease to Sjogren disease, which another uh, disease involving salivary glands, um, and compared it to normal control, so high IL-4 expression, high TGF expression in the salivary gland and also in the uh, peripheral blood, high IL-10 expression, FOXP3 uh, FOX expression, so this is T-Rex, 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 TH2, which support the IL, uh, IgG4 secretion. Um, higher uh, CD4, CD25 percentage, kind of it's very convincing, with, but healthy control is about 1.5%, of the total uh, CD4, and they had 3% our patient or the IgG4 related disease patient. Um, when they checked actually uh, mRNA expression from biopsies, then again, these are controls and these are IgG4 related diseases. Um, high expression of IL4, uh, high expression of IL5, IL10, TGF beta. Um, I never I was never able to get such, such a nice picture with gels, but <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful PCRs. Uh, very high expression of FOXT3, yeah, exactly. um, and again, the same IL-4 increase, IL-5. Again, TH2, T-Rex, which drive the inflammation. A lot of CD4, CD25 positive cell in the tissue, and yeah. in contrast to only two, which found in a control, primary uh, sclerosing cholangitis, um, and that's another uh, cartoon to demonstrate studying the inflammation. If we don't know what the cause is, lead to TH2 and T-Rex uh, activation, and then IgG4 and fibrosis. So the epidemi epidemiology is fully described. Uh, the majority are men, uh, age about 50. Um, most studies are from Japan and focus on autoimmune creatitis. So we don't know exactly what is uh, the frequency of other uh, IgG4 related disease which involve other organs. Um, clinical features again, tumor like swelling which involve uh, many organs, subacute presentation. Patients are not ill, so they don't have high fever. Their CRP is uh, normal most of the time. Uh, and in, most, in many cases, this is found only as an incidental finding. Um, but it can also have uh, more uh, significant effects. So IgG4-related cholangitis can lead to hepatic failure. IgG-related otitis can lead to aneurysm and aortic dissection. Uh, tubular interstitial nephritis can lead to renal failure. And destructive bone lesion can mimic Wegener uh, disease. Um, and that, I think you have it uh, at the end. But almost each and every organ can be affected by IgG4-related disease. Someone want to go over that, and you have it uh, in here. Uh, but the thing that might be more interesting for us is that when you think about ear, nose, and sinus involvement, and it says in many uh, papers that allergic phenomena are common in IgG4 related disease. Uh, people have uh, nasal polyps, asthma, allergic rhinitis, peripheral xenophilia. Um, and my question was whether it's right or not. So if you check the literature, there are almost no data on that. Uh, only two or three papers, and most of them are based on small studies and unclear criteria. The one paper which actually tries to evaluate allergic manifestation in autoimmune pancreatitis described 45 patients, 20 had uh, some allergic disease, which include acute allergic rhinitis, I don't know what it is, uh, atopic dermatitis, bronchial asthma in three patients, drug allergy. Um, so it's very difficult to draw any conclusion from that. Uh, but if you, write, if you read between the lines, so um, when people with Mikulic uh, syndrome disease, which had involvement of the upper airways, then in this case, you do find higher frequency or um, 
or prevalence of allergic rhinitis and bronchial asthma with 40% of, and 14%. And we can, when you compare that to the general Japanese population, so the allergic rhinitis uh, um, found in 5 to 10%, and asthma only in 3 to 5%. So there might be something in there. And another paper which actually studies the studied the response to rituximab, again, describe allergic uh, diseases and asthma in 6 out of 10 patients. So this is mostly, this. I think that's the, all the data I saw about allergy and IgG4 related disease. Uh, so do we miss a lot of patients who has IgG4 related disease? I don't think so. And if we do miss them, does it mean anything? Or do we have to be more aggressive in looking for that? I'm not sure about it either. Because if you think about the treatment, so the first thing you need to ask yourself when you find some, have someone with IgG4 disease is do we need to treat them at all? Uh, so aggressive treatment is needed when a vital organ is involved, no doubt. Uh, but infadenopathy for itself doesn't need any treatment, and watchful waiting in many cases is very reasonable. Um, so when to suspect that? Maybe when we see someone with sinus polyps or more persistent disease, then this is something that we might want to think about, and then we can send them to the ENT, get a biopsy, and see uh, if they have all the other criteria to to fulfill the criteria for IgG4 related disease. The treatment protocol is uh, quite simple. We we'll start with, with steroid as the first line of therapy. And this is a very effective treatment in majority of patients. And some people suggest that it should be one of the criteria to define IgG4 related disease. You then proceed with the maintenance uh, using azathioprine, MMF, or methotrexate for up to three years. Uh, rituximab was success successful when used for recurrent or refractory disease. Uh, and fibrotic disease is less likely to respond to treatment, but it does respond as well to treatment. So this is uh, for to describe the treatment. You start with 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram of prednisone with rapid tapering down and long-term maintenance dose uh, to prevent recurrence. And rituximab was very effective uh, in non-responding patient with a very rapid drop in all IgG uh, subclasses, but also in the IgG uh, levels as well. Whether that was just an association, part of the disease, we don't know. And I was wondering whether IgG4 related disease is kind of the anti hypex uh, syndrome. So that's something we might want to think about. Are they constipated? <laughs> <laughs> you know, constipated. Maybe, maybe. There is no IgG subclass 4 deficiency syndrome, though. Uh, there is, but it usually goes with IgG2 and IgA, so you but don't, don't isolate. know isolated. No. Yeah. So this is very confusing. The first half of the talk is the therapeutic benefits of this molecule. The same half is the diseases. What? And I'll say, if you, if you oh, actually you think it's second. just an epiphenomenon? Yes. Well, it's probably just the immune you, you system expect, being out of balance. Theoretically, you could expect that if you're giving immunotherapy and you reduce high, very high dose of IgG4, then the side effect will be IgG4-related disease in this patient, or at least some increased frequency in the IgG4-related disease. And as far as we know, you don't get any fibrosis on immunotherapy patient, immunotherapy patient. So I think it's just an epiphenomenon. And that's not actually, that's the response to so the it's same... So really a T-reg disease? I think it is a T-reg I know if T-regs or B-regs, because other people also suggest that B-regulatory cells, well, but some cells which secrete TGS beta and uh, IL-10 are responsible for the disease. If, and there is, there is a myeloma with sort of monoclonal elevated IgG4. There is. And, if, and do they have any... Common? No, they don't have some So it's not the base. I think that, again, it's an epiphenomenon. That's, uh, it's not part of the cause for the disease. If you look at the IgG4 literature, obviously you have, and you see these diseases with fibrosis, how do they postulate that IgG4 is implicated in that fibrosis? Is it just a, another epiphenomenon I think that's finding a, there as well? I think that's the same response to the IL-10, IL-4. That's, that's, there is high, very high levels of IL-10, very high levels of TGF-beta, both in use class which from IgG, you know, from IgM to IgG4, and that's why you see the very high level of IgG4 plasma cells. And if you take tissue culture, if you take B cells, can you can you change switch them after they're mature? From the IgM, yeah, that's what happens usually. From IgG1 to IgG4, which you showed one of those pictures up there where you showed the chain switching. Is that really possible to take one that's committed and 
force it to switch yeah, again? So I didn't know the answer, and that's something I was wondering as well. So obviously, uh, the way this is the chromosome 14, and the way the heavy chains are, uh, heavy chain gene appears um, on the chromosome, starting with the mu, which is the IgM sequence uh, coding for the IgM. This is IgD, this is IgG3, IgG1, IgG2, and I, I think that will be IgG4 in humans. Uh, but actually, when the B cell class switch to another uh, heavy chain, then some of the genes are being uh, excised. Uh, so as long as you don't, you still have it downstream, you can potentially class switch to another uh, IgG subclass. Uh, so some people do suggest that you can start with IgG4 and then class switch to IgE. Uh, I saw only one paper which was actually saying that. Um, and uh, the other way around can happen. You can switch from IgE back to IgE because you don't have, to IgG because you don't have uh, the gene in there. And I actually wasn't sure about it. I was asking Hans if he knew uh, what, was the, what was the answer. And he was telling me that potentially as long as you have the downstream uh, genes, then you can class switch further on to another subclasses, but he doesn't know what uh, trigger B cells to do that. So potentially if you have the B cell with the genes and the right environment, cytokine environment, you can push it further to further, sub further uh, subclass switch to another subclass. Yeah, there is potential. Uh, no? Next week, Steve, you're the presenter. Is that right? What's that? Steve, you're presenting next week. Yeah. And then, uh, then we have a break for the meeting, and then the first session after the meeting is we try and review the whole meeting in one session. So it would be helpful if somebody took some notes, uh, and we have a you know a mutual discussion. If anybody wants to present something, just prepare a brief two or three PowerPoint. Something that you heard. Can I share one more thing? Yeah. 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 Somebody has time. Uh, so I was searching the literature and, and further to understand what is, the, what is the nature of the confusion between IgG4 and IgA, and I found this paper uh, from 1982, which actually checked if monoclonal antibodies to IgG4 can induce histamine release. And it was shown that actually antibodies again IgG4, which means that you course react and IgG4 attached to basophil can induce histamine release. Uh, so took them about 10 years, I think 10 years later there was another article, that's the only paper which suggests that IDG4 uh, or other IDGs that don't, that is not in due system in release from basophil. And actually they also saw some release of histamine uh, induced by IDGs. Uh, it took them quite a lot of effort to try and explain that there are already IgG complexes on these basal fields, and then you actually force link the, IgG, the IgEs on the basal field, which causes okay. these uh, But that's kind of the problem. So it's it's yeah. The data is not that solid that IgG doesn't cause any has Christopher ever done any papers after the first one? Yeah, well, a lot of stuff. Very interesting.